11. Daniel chapter 11 is the most criticized chapter in the book of Daniel. And you know, you know why? You know why it's the, the most widely criticized chapter in the book of Daniel? Everybody know why? Well, yeah, yeah essentially many, many say that, he, that either he wrote it, which would deny the information we have on when Daniel was born, but that he wrote it after the stuff already happened, which we're going to see is like hundreds of years. So there's some who say, the, the big problem is they say it's criticized because people say there's no way that he could have, could have written all this stuff that tied in so well to, to what ended up happening in history. Um, people say that there's no way. So either Daniel wasn't born as early as what, what we believe that he was, or that he didn't even write it at all, that somebody else wrote it hundreds of years after these events then actually ended up happening, that then, then he wrote it, or then somebody wrote it. It's because what is predicted in this chapter was fulfilled so exactly in so many, so many details. Some Bible, Bible scholars have counted around 135 prophecies that were fulfilled just out of Daniel chapter 11. I, I didn't even try to count or anything. That seems like even a lot from what, what I've seen and studying, but, but there are a lot of them, and they, a lot of them were fulfilled so exactly. And of course, Daniel was actually just revealing what who told him. Well, well actually, an angel. an angel told him who, of course, God told the angel. And so God told Daniel through an angel these things. So again, it wasn't that, you know, Daniel wasn't dreaming this stuff up himself. He didn't even understand what, what a lot of it meant. But God revealed it to him through that angel. And again, unfortunately, even many who claim some kind of a Christian faith today still don't believe that the Bible is the very Word of God, nor do they believe the many of the supernatural things that are described in the Bible, including, again, the prediction of all these details that we see here in chapter 11. So the angel was still revealing things to Daniel here as we read chapter 11. As the angel began to explain to Daniel or reveal to Daniel back in chapter 10. Daniel was hoping for Israel's ultimate deliverance to this kingdom of peace that God had promised them. Daniel was putting pieces together from what Jeremiah had prophesied and, and, and he saw that the 70 years should be about up. Or, you know, the 70 years of captivity of Israel in Babylon w was actually up. The, the king of Babylon had been killed. The Medo-Persians had taken over. He was putting all the pieces together and he was kind of figuring on that God was going to deliver this, this kingdom of peace. To, to Israel, but the angel told Daniel that that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. The Jews were going to experience much more oppression and conflict and suffering before the time of their ultimate deliverance arrived, even though they were going to get to return as a people to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the temple, that kingdom of peace, that ultimate deliverance of Israel, not only wasn't going to happen in Daniel's time, it wasn't going to happen for a long, long time. And the reality is, folks, it still hasn't happened today. Verses 2 through 35 here in chapter 11 were prophecies of events involving the eventual downfall of the Medo-Persian Empire and then the rise of which empire? Greece. The, the Greek Empire. I'm going to summarize what I'm going to, how I'm going to present this. We will read the verses, and then I'm going to summarize the actual events that eventually fulfilled the amazing prophecies given in these verses. I hope you've all read, at least read chapter 11. When you, when you read the verses, it's hard to make heads or tail out of it, honestly. It, it, is, it is hard to understand what the heck was the angel revealing. What was he talking about? But the deal is, whenever you look at world history, you can see what he was talking about. And these kings of the north and the kings of the south and what they were all about. And so that's, what I'm, that's how I'm going to explain it. I'm going to read certain verses and then I'm going to tell you, here's what happened in history to fulfill this. Because all this stuff that Daniel wrote, verses 2 through 35, didn't happen for like 350 years. 
But then when it did happen, it's amazing. Amazing how exactly it fulfilled the things that, did, that the angel told Daniel. After Cyrus, there would be... Um, uh, let, let's just read verse 2 here, and then I, I just have a little bit to say about that, and then we'll move on. Let's look at verse 2. Chapter 11, verse 2. Now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth who will be far richer. This fourth will be far richer than all the others. And when he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. So after Cyrus... The, the Persian king Cyrus, there would be three more kings in Persia. And history shows these things again. And then a fourth king would arise who would be richer than all the other previous kings of Persia. And what would he do? What, did, what would the prophecy say that this king would do? Stir up Greece because he, he would attack Greece. Well, the, that king turned out to be Xerxes. He's also known as Azareus. Um, it's hard to say again. Who we read about? Who, where do we read about Azareus or Xerxes in old, other Old Testament books? Esther. Esther and also Ezra. So Xerxes tried to conquer Greece. <coughs> he had a little bit of success, but then he, his forces suffered a number of butt whoopings, including that his navy was defeated. And he eventually retreated and gave up. And again, you can, you can search world history and find out the details about all that. Uh, I could share a whole lot of, a lot of other information about it, but that's not, that's not the purpose here. Look at verses 3 and 4 with me. Then a mighty king will arise, who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power that he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. So, first of all, I want to I want to point out on our slide here. I have this one up so I can see it because I don't want to fall off the stage trying to look at that one. But again, Medo-Persian Empire. Remember way back when we started the book of Daniel. And who had this vision of this statue? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had this vision, and that Daniel would explain it. We went over all this long ago. But the Medo-Persian Empire was represented by the, the chest and arms of silver. And then what came next represented by the, the belly and the thighs of the, in the statue? Greece. The, the, the kingdom of, of Greece. And so... To start with, again, we just talked about the Persian Empire and that there would be some more kings you know, that would come and then you would have this one king who would stir up Greece by attacking her and so forth. And then we read the verses 3 and 4 and it start talking about this new world power. And so this new world power, talking about in, in verse, verses 3 and 4 here, would be what empire? The Greek Empire. The Empire of Greece who followed the Medo-Persian. After Xerxes got the Greeks all stirred up, then the Greeks ended up conquering them. And it describes this mighty king that when Greece became the new king on the block, the, the, the new bully on the block of the world, and this powerful king that, that came in to be that led Greece into this world power realm, that, that mighty king was whom? Alexander. Alexander the Great. Again, who we can read about in history. We should also remember that, and Daniel, go, go to, the, to the other slide showing the, the beast and so forth on it as well. Yes, and again, these are pretty dim on this screen, but you can probably see them better there. But remember that eventually Daniel had, had these dreams about beasts. And, and the, the beast that corresponded with the, the belly and the legs of iron, or, or iron and bronze in the Nebi statue was a leopard with how many heads? Keep, keep hitting numbers, you'll get one of them, Kiwi. At least you're guessing. Four. Four heads the leopards had. I guessed four, it. Four heads the leopard had. And you, you guessed that one, Brody? So you got to guess louder. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. But go ahead and guess. See, so you would have had it right. And then remember about the goat. And, and, and we're going to talk about that. That, that goat had, had at first had what? One big horn. And then that horn got what? Bro broken off. And how many others grew up? Four. Four. <laughs> Kiwi's still trying to get the ten. The ten, the ten you, you got to get down here to, the, to this 
beast. This beast is the one that had the tens, the fourth beast. The third, the third it was four. And why was it four? What was the four heads and what, what were the four horns on the goat that grew up after the one got broke, broken off? After Alexander the Great died, it was divided up between four of his generals. There are the four horns that grew up after the one got broken off. See, we've got to go back and preach at the beginning of Daniel again, right? And you're saying, oh, no, 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 no. No, I won't. But that's what we looked at before early, early in, um, in the book of Daniel. And of course, again, out of one of those four horns then that grew up on the goat, it started out with a big horn who was who? Alexander the Great. Then after he died, it was broken off and four horns grew up. And then out of one of those four horns grew up what? What kind of horn? Well, actually, yeah, a small a horn that started out small, but then grew big. And we got to be careful calling it little horn because it is not the little horn represented. The little horn that we end up seeing is represented in the for the, for the fourth beast, and he hasn't come on the scene yet. This is all about the third beast the leopard, and as well as the goat, which depicts the division of the empire of Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great died young without an heir. And Daniel, you can go to the, to the, to the Greek kingdom uh, slide with the divided kingdom then. Alexander the Great died young without an heir. You remember we talked about that before. His kingdom divided among four of his generals. And out of the four of, the, of Alexander's uh, generals who took over empires, two of those rose to prominence. Two, two of the four empires rose to prominence uh, over the other two. The, the first kingdom was the Seleucid kingdom, and the second kingdom was the, the, Tol the Ptolemies. And here again, on the, on the slide here, I showed this clear back when I did my introduction to, to the book of Daniel. But this, this was Alexander the Great's kingdom. His entire kingdom it was a huge kingdom. But then the next slide, Daniel, is the one we're really after. After he died, it got divided up into these four. And the, the two primary ones, the, the first one, the Ptolemies, were here in, in the area of Egypt. And they were, they were based out of Egypt. And, th and they also then went, went up into this area, which when you start getting up into this area, you're getting into the area of what? Israel. The Seleucids were this northern kingdom. And they were kind of centered in Syria up here. And so these two, these two characters, these two divisions of the Greek Empire ended up being the two main players in the block as things unfolded. They, they developed into the powerful ones. And what, what you, I hope again you've read chapter 11, the battles between the north and the south, spoken of in, up through verse 35, it's about the battles between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. The Seleucids in the north, the Ptolemies in the south. Syria being kind of the center of operation for the northern kingdom, the Seleucids, and Egypt being uh, the, the center of uh, operations for the southern kingdom of the Tol Ptolemies. And in the middle of those two empires was, again, what, what nation? Israel. Israel. And what ended up happening is... Those, those two divisions of the Greek Empire started fighting each other, warring against each other. And they were always taking turns taking over Israel. <laughs> Israel was right in the middle of them and they would meet in the middle and fight and whoever would win would take over the nation of Israel. Suppress the nation of Israel for a time, and then then the other one would make a reattack and end up kicking them out. And then they'd take over Israel, and it just it bounced back and forth. And that's what these accounts in Daniel chapter 11 were predicting. Remember, these accounts written way before this stuff happened, written before actually even Alexander the Great even lived. <clears throat> This was Israel's future. What the angel was revealing to Daniel was the future of Israel, and it was not peace. It was a continuation of the oppression and the warfare and the suffering that they would experience. So now, look at verses 5 and 6. 5 and 6. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he. 
and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance. But she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed, together with her royal escort and her father, and the one who supported her. <coughs> So again, here we read about the first king of the south. And what history tells us now? History tells us that the king of the south was Ptolemy I Soter. And the first king of the north ended up being Seleucus I Nicator. Seleucus I, the first king of the northern division, he had originally served under Ptolemy, King Ptolemy, as a general. He originally had served under him. Remember what the verses we just read said. Predicted in a very general way. What I'm telling you is what history records ended up happening. And it talks about one of his commanders would, would, would eventually become a king himself and even stronger than him. Stronger than the king of the south. That ended up again being this situation that I'm describing. That Seleucus, had, Seleucus I had actually been underneath. He was a commander, a general under Ptolemy I. But then he ended up becoming more powerful as the, as the king of the northern kingdom. And that fulfills the prophecy in verse 5. Verse 6 was fulfilled when the descendants of Ptolemy I and Seleucus I were kings of the kingdoms of the north and the south. The daughter of the king of the south mentioned here in verse 6, I'm explaining to you what actually ended up happening hundreds of years later. The daughter, it mentions in, in verse 6 there, would have been Berenice. She was the daughter, ended up being, again, generations down the road from the original kings. She ended up being the daughter of Ptolemy II Philadelphus. She was his daughter, and it was arranged for her, the daughter of the king of the south, to marry a guy named Antiochus II Theos, who was the king of the north at the, by this point. Again, down the road in history a little ways. To create an alliance between the north and the south. Uh, Antiochus II Theos was already married. He was married to a lady named Laodice. But no problem. He just what? Just divorced her. However, the alliance fell through in less than two years whenever um, Berenice's dad, you know, the daughter that was given of the southern king, the southern king ended up dying. And so now this alliance that he figured he was striking by giving his daughter to marry the king of the north, that, that, that alliance went to put once he died. Well then, Antiochus II Theos, the king of the northern kingdom, who had married the daughter of the second kingdom after divorcing the wife he had, he decided, well, I've tried them both now, I like the first wife better. So he divorced the second wife and remarried the first wife. And the way culture worked back then, these ladies didn't have any say in the matter. Except that, um, Miss, Miss uh, uh, now I forget her name already, the, 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 the one that he had married the second time, Berenice, she, of course, was then jilted and divorced, and, and the, God, the, kingdom, the king of the north married again the, his first wife. Well, the second wife didn't like that, and you know what she did? She killed him. She killed the daughter of the king of the south, who he, he had married before, you know, before, like after he divorced the wife the first time, married the daughter of the king of the south, and then divorced her, but now that wasn't enough. So the, the first wife killed her and killed the infant son that the two of them had had, the king and the girl from the south had had together. She killed all, all three of them. This is, this is what history tells us. I say, good golly, Miss Molly. <laughs> what, what, what a Peyton place, ancient Peyton place, right? Well, let's go to verses 7 through 10. All that stuff fulfilled, verses 5 and 6. 7 through 10. One from her family line will arise to take her place. That was the, the daughter of the, um, of the south. 
the king from the south. He, this one who will arise will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off back to Egypt. For some years he will leave the kingdom, king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will end up retreating to his own country. And then his sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army which will sweep like an irresistible flood. This is about the king of the north, his sons. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle back as far as his fortress, the fortress of the king of the south. So, that's confusing enough to read it. But now let me tell you what history says ended up fulfilling that. Bernice, who, who Bernice again was, had been the, the daughter of the, or not Bernice, Berenice, who had been the daughter of the king of the south, who had been married to the king of the north, and then he divorced her. Her brother, Ptolemy III Euergetes, became king of the south. That was the one from the family. That fulfills verse 7. I know this is hard to, hard to follow, but I, I, I don't know any other way to present it. I'm relating to you history and the names of the people who fulfilled all that Daniel wrote as the angel revealed to him. And so this guy was the one from her family who became king. He went north, attacked the new king of the north, who was Seleucus II. Callinicus and Ptolemy the third from the south won a substantial victory when he attacked the north. He killed Laodice, the woman who had killed the king who had just remarried her, plus the daughter of the king from the south, plus the child that the daughter of the king from the south had with the king from the north. That lady, this her brother who came from the south and attacked the north, killed the woman who killed his sister. That, that's what fulfilled all this that we just read in these verses. These are the names of the people involved. This is how this stuff was fulfilled. Believe me, this takes a lot of hours to work through to, to pull these details out. But this is what happened. This is how it was fulfilled hundreds of years later. These verses that you say, what can I, don't, I can't understand any of that. This is what happened. This is what it fulfilled. It was prophecy of what would end up happening. This king from the south, Ptolemy III, he carried off a bunch of wealth from the northern kingdom and he went back to Egypt. That fulfilled verse 8. This is what this Ptolemy III did. Historical records verify that. And that fulfilled, again, verse 8. Later on, Seleucus II, the king of the north, went south. He made a revenge attack on Egypt, but he lost badly. And he took his army home with his tail between his legs. That fulfilled what we read in verse 9. If you, if you look back at the verses a little bit, I, if I take time to do all of it, you really won't be happy with me because we'll be here an hour and a half or more. But if you look at the verses, that fulfilled verse 9. Remember, world history records record these events and these names and stuff that I'm giving you long after Daniel wrote down the prophecies that we, that we read in, in chapter 11. So Seleucus III Soter later succeeded Seleucus II as king of the north, and he teamed up with a brother of his, Antiochus III the Great, and they planned a massive attack on Egypt because they're still not happy about, you know, the north, the south has been beaten up on the north. It's the battle of the north and the south, except it's not the civil war, it's the seleucid Ptolemaic wars. And so these guys planned this massive attack, but before they could even get the invasion started, the guy that was king, Seleucus III Soter, was killed before they could even get going with it. So his brother, Antiochus III the Great, took over as king of the north, and he swept south toward Egypt with a huge army. He defeated some of the forces of the king of the south who were in Israel, which was on the way down. The, the king of the south had some forces in Israel because they had taken it over. But now this, this Antiochus III, the great, he attacked and defeated the forces that the king of the south had in Israel and took over Israel at that point. And, and in Israel at this time, by the name, by the way, he was Ptolemy IV, Philopater. That's who the king of the south was at this point. And then the king of the north, this Antiochus III, the great, he headed for Ptolemy's fortress in Egypt. That all fulfilled verse 10. What, what you read about in verse 10 that Daniel wrote about, hundreds of years later, that's how that got fulfilled. Those details I just gave you, you can look those up in world history. I'm sure you're all going to run home and do that. I, I know you are. 
Or maybe in this case, you'll just believe what I tell you, right? <clears throat> Verses 11 through 19. 11 through 19. Then the king of the south, it says, will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. And when the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army, larger than the first. And after several years, he will advance with a huge army, fully equipped. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. Those who are violent among your own people. Whose own people? Daniel's own people, whom the angel was taught, telling all this stuff to, will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. And then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a what? A fortified city. Remember that detail. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself where? In the beautiful land, that's Israel. And will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom. That's his ultimate goal. But his plans will not succeed or help him. And then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them, but a what? A commander will put an end to his insolence. Think, remember that detail too. And will turn his insolence back on him. And after this, he will turn back toward the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. Now, all these details, what does all that mean? I'm about to tell you what ended up happening. Again, this was the prediction. This is what the angel told Daniel was someday going to happen. Here's the fulfillment of it. Again, the, the kingdom of the south at this point was Ptolemy the fourth Philopater. He marched his big army. The army of the north had already took Israel back, defeated some Egyptian forces, uh, southern forces in Israel. But now he's moving on toward Egypt. And the king of Egypt, he's saying, I'm going out to meet him. And so he took a huge army to meet the huge army of the north that was coming down. In a fierce battle between two large armies, history tells us that Ptolemy IV Philopater's forces successfully defended Egypt and defeated the army of Antiochus III the Great and eventually even retook the land of Israel. So now Israel's back under the south again. You know, it just keeps back and bouncing back and forth. Ptolemy IV Philopater had many thousands of captured soldiers from the north slaughtered. And he became known as being extremely arrogant. But Ptolemy IV, the king of the south, would not remain victorious. That was one of the details in, in the, the verses that we just read here. He and his wife died suddenly and mysteriously around 13 years later. And all this stuff again is fulfilling verses 11 and 12 that we read. And Antiochus III, the great, rebuilt his army in the north to an even greater army than the first one. And two years after Ptolemy IV died, Antiochus III again marched south. And he drove the armies of Egypt out of where again? Israel, on the way to Egypt, retook Israel, the land of Israel, for the northern kingdom. And he, and he continued on. And this time, when the king of the, king of the north took over Israel, it was for good. It was going to stay under the control of the Seleucid Empire un, until their empire got completely knocked out of, the, out of the picture and the next empire rose, which would have been the Roman Empire. So Antiochus III the Great was joined by forces from other neighboring countries as well as some Jews. And the fulfillment of the passage in verse 14 where it said that some violent men from your own people would join the king, that ended, happening, ended up happening that when all this stuff ended up happening hundreds of years later, when it ended up happening, there were Jews who joined the forces of Antiochus the Great from the northern kingdom, probably hoping to maybe secure Israel's independence if they helped him. But of course, do you think that happened? No, it didn't happen. The forces of Egypt were able to resist the huge northern army plus the additional forces that they had picked up. And so the, the armies of the south were beaten back. And that included the deciding victory for Antiochus III the Great over the fortified city of Sidon. 
world history tells us this. Remember, that fulfills verses 15 and 16 that talked about the king of the north going against a fortified city. That ended up being the battle for the fortress city of Sidon. And Antiochus, his forces won that battle and that fulfilled verse 17. Or, or verses 15 and 16. Then we move on to verse. what's in verse 17. Antiochus III, the Great, apparently thought that if he gave his daughter to Ptolemy V Epiphanes, the, the very young new king of the south, if he gave uh, Antiochus the Great figured if he gave his daughter to the king of the south, then maybe he would end up being able to take over all of Egypt because his daughter was married to the, the king that he was going to let, let in there, let, let stay as a king of Egypt, sort of as a, as a puppet type of deal. But as it turned out, his daughter ended up taking her husband's side in the whole deal. And so all, all that Antiochus the Great planned in giving his daughter in marriage to the king of the south went for naught because she ended up siding with the man that she married, that her father gave her over to marriage for. And guess what the name of the daughter of Antiochus the Third the Great? Guess what the name of his daughter was? Cleopatra. Cleopatra. And it's not the Cleopatra that you're thinking it is. But it was her great, 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 great grandmother. The, the Cleopatra that you know of from the sagas of the movies, and that she ended up getting getting in the affair with Mark Anthony of Rome and all that kind of stuff. That happened many, many, many hundreds of years after this Cleopatra, but it was her descendant. Like I said, great, 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 great grandmother, I believe, because it was Cleopatra the fifth. There were ended up being five Cleopatras, four of them up to the fifth one that you all know. And that, my friends, is the rest of the story. The young guy, young folks are saying, what's that, what's that? Yeah. Well, there was a guy named Paul Harvey, and he always told the rest of the story. Anyway, only us old people know that. So, Antiochus the Great's plan to take over all of Egypt, he, he held on to Israel and some of the land south of them, um, but he was not able to take over all of Egypt. And because his plan in giving his daughter away failed. <laughs> and so he ended up then turning his attention to conquering coastal areas and islands of the Mediterranean Sea. And although he initially had some success there, he ended up agitating a growing world power. And what world power that was growing do you think he agitated? Rome. Rome. And so Rome had begun to establish a presence in that area and the prediction in verse 18 that a commander would put an end to the arrogance of the king of the north. I'm about to tell you what the name of that Roman commander was that fulfilled that prophecy. It was Asiaticus. Asiaticus, the Roman general Asiaticus, whom you can find again in world history. He, he came in there to give old Antiochus the Great a setback and give him a whooping and he defeated him and not only did he defeat Antiochus' army as Antiochus' army was retreating and this is Antiochus the Great because there's another Antiochus coming up as many of you know but even as the enemy was even as his enemy as Antiochus' enemy Antiochus the, the, the third the Great's army was retreating he even attacked them as they retreated and basically chased them the whole way back up to Syria it humiliated Antiochus the Great, and it brought an end to his career. He agreed to numerous concessions to Rome. He signed a treaty with Rome, and he returned to his home country where he was eventually killed trying to rob a Greek temple. All this fulfilled verse 19. Again, remember, this happened 350 years after Daniel wrote about it, as the angel told him about it. And you can find this stuff again in world history. Verse 20. Verse 20. His successor. Whose successor? Who were we just talking about? King of the, North. the King of the North. Antiochus III, the Great, he was known as. His successor will send out what? A tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed. And that, and that he is meaning the successor to Antiochus III the Great, the new king. He will be destroyed. 
but not in anger or not in battle. The king won't die in, in, in somebody's fit of anger to kill him, nor in a, in a battle. We'll see how he ended up dying. And Tychus III, the great son, Seleucus IV, Philopater, followed his dad as king of the north, but history says he doesn't last long because he sent out a guy named Heliodorus, who was his treasurer. What's it referred to? What did Daniel prophesy? Tax collector. The treasurer went out to collect a heavy tax debt from the citizens that were left of that kingdom, of their kingdom. The, the, this uh, Alexander, or Antiochus III, the great son, Seleucus, sent out this treasurer as a te to collect these taxes to pay for what? What do you think he had to pay for? To, to actually pay for the treaty that, that Antiochus the Great signed with Rome, one of the conditions of the treaty was a huge annual payment. And it was starting to drain the kingdom. And so this new king, Seleucus IV, sent out Heliodorus to collect these taxes. But I think he got so much grief and, and who, who knows what all was going on. But guess what he came back and did? He came back and killed the king. <laughs> and it wasn't in anger. It wasn't an act of war. It was a pre-planned assassination. And that fulfilled, again, what we've read here in verse 20. Fulfilling in, again, exact detail what ended up happening hundreds of years later. Verse 21. He will be succeeded. Who? The, the one that just got killed, who only was in place for a little while. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty, actually. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure and he will seize it through intrigue. Now... At this point, everything starts to revolve around this man just described here in verse 21. This contemptible person. This next Seleucid king of the north. The contemptible person who next became king of the north and fulfilled verses 21 through 35 was also a son of Antiochus III the Great, but he was not the rightful heir to the throne, which was predicted in what I read in verse 21. He did, not, he did not deserve that title of royalty. royalty. He took it. He was not the next in line for the throne. And who was that man? Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. He was a despicable man who seized the throne deceitfully, and he ultimately took control by murdering a four-year-old who was the next legal in, in line to the throne. Oftentimes when that would happen, when kings died or, or were killed, the next in line for the throne was often a child. And so that someone would rule as a co-regent until the child grew up old enough. Antiochus IV was not going to take the chance of that. He killed, had that four-year-old kid killed. He was the predicted horn of the goat that started out small but grew in power in Daniel chapter 8 that I pointed out on the previous slide about how there would be a, a small horn, a horn that would, that would grow out of one of the four horns that would start out small and then grow much greater. That again, we're finally getting to the guy that that was talking about, that that was prophesying. It was prophesying in Tychus the fourth Epiph Epiphanes, the guy that's in view here in these these prophetic verses now. This guy in Tychus the fourth Epiphanes would also foreshadow. He would be a type of. He would be a picture of another king who would be like him, only much, 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 much worse someday. And that person that he would foreshadow, that future ruler who would be like himself, only so much worse, was going to be the little horn of the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7. The ruler who will come, described in Daniel chapter 9. The man of lawlessness, described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the, the beast, described in Revelation chapter 13. The one that we know so well as the Antichrist. Verses 22 through 28. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. 
Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully. And with only a few people, he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. That, that will be fulfilled as we're going to see here. His army will be swept away and many will fall in battle. The two kings with their hearts bent on evil will sit at the same table and lie to each other. But to no avail because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. So, the predictions in these verses were fulfilled in various actions and involvement of Antiochus IV Epiphanes with Egypt and Israel. The details, i got to tell you, are lengthy. Scholars do disagree about some of, the, uh, some of how they were fulfilled. Not can't too much today to get, try to get into, and you can be happy about that I don't. But in general, Antiochus IV Epiphanes enjoyed a lot of military success, successes, and, and a lot of it was accomplished through deceitfulness. Once again, the land of Israel was between the fighting of the Seleucids in the north and the Ptolemies in the south. The Jewish high priest, Onias, was killed at some point, and we would believe that that would fulfill the prophecy that the prince of the covenant would be destroyed that we read in these verses that we just got done reading. The prince of the covenant. And the holy covenant is also mentioned. We've got to believe that that's the covenant that God had made with the nation of Israel. Antiochus IV Epiphanes used some kind of a Robin Hood policy, attacking and taking the wealth from the rich and giving a portion of the booty to those who supported him. And of course, as long as he did that, he tended to have the support of those people because he kept sharing some of the spoils with them. But that didn't last forever either. Antiochus IV Epiphanes moved to attack King Ptolemy III, Philopater of the South. And, and that king fought, his armies fought against Antiochus for a while, but in the end he was defeated. Due in part to him, the king of the South, being betrayed, betrayed by some of his own people. I pointed that out in the, in the verses. I think it referred to people who ate with him, tried to have him destroyed. That was fulfilled when some of, some of the um, forces with the Egyptians and some of the people in the government of the Egyptians actually, um, what, what do you call that when you, you go against your own government? Treason. Treason was the word I was looking for. Committed acts of treason and went against their king. And that, that, led, that was some of what led to, to their eventual defeat. Him being betrayed by some of the, the people who were closest to him. And so Antiochus IV Epiphanes then, he allowed again this, Enti this um, Ptolemy III to remain in Egypt as the king. And he headed back north, but he allowed him in ki as king just to sort of rule under his jurisdiction. Uh, again, he still had left him with the uh, understanding that he was still submitting to Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And Antiochus is headed back north, but he stopped off in Jerusalem on the way to squash a rebellion, and he took a lot of wealth from the Jewish temple, and that was the first obvious indication of his, anti his antagonism toward, toward the people of Israel, against the, the Jewish people. So now, again, all that stuff is fulfilling a lot of the, those things that we read in verses 22 through, through 28. Look at verses 29 and 30. We're heading down the home stretch here. Hang in there. At the appointed time, he will invade the south again. Who's he? Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the king from the north, will invade the south again. But this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him, and he will lose heart. And then he will turn back and vent his fury against what? The Holy Covenant. The Holy Covenant. Got to be a reference to who did God make a Holy Covenant with? Israel. 
And He will tr return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. That's a, that's a prediction that there will, would be Jews who would actually forsake the covenant with God, forsake God Himself, and align themselves with Antiochus. Epiphanies, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanies, in, in hopes of giving themselves a better life or whatever. His arm. Um, yeah, we'll just we'll stop there first. Stop at verse thirty. So two years later, two years after Antiochus the Fourth whipped up on on the southern kingdom. Two years after that, he returned to beat up on Egypt again. Guess who got involved again on the side of the southern kingdom? Rome. Rome once again intervened. And Antiochus IV Epiphanes, remembering what his father went through, remember his father was the one that Rome came to the aid of Egypt, the, king, the, the kingdom of the south, came to their aid and helped chase his father away and defeat him. Antiochus didn't forget that. He knew that with Rome's army along with the army of the south, there was no way he was going to be able to fend off, defeat both of them. And so he backed off. He was humiliated. And he was enraged. And he headed north. And on the way north, as we read in the prophecy verses that we just read, what did he take out his anger on? The nation of Israel specifically, especially the city of Jerusalem and the temple. These, these events, folks, again, these happened. But these events, as Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes himself in general, even the events of the desolation of the temple and killing of many Jews and everything, it happened, but it was also a what? It was a... can't understand you with the lollipop being kid. It was also a picture or a type, a foreshadowing of what? What later on the Antichrist would do to Israel and to the temple and to the Jewish people and so forth. That's a huge thing to take out. All these details, so many more details about Antiochus IV Epiphanes than any of these other characters that I've told you the names of because the, the, the essential perspective to gain from that was that this was a picture of another guy like him who would come except do even worse things one day. Antiochus' army ransacked the temple. They stopped worship services. They killed many Jews. They took women and children as slaves. They burned much of the city. They butchered a hog where? In the Holy of Holies in the temple. In the place that represented the very presence of God. They, they, they butchered a hog there on the altar. And they set up an image to be worshipped in the temple. The abomination that causes desolation. Version 1. Antiochus got many Jews who were not true believers to follow him. And they obeyed his command to worship the image. And they turned away from God. But some committed believers faithfully followed God. They resisted Antiochus. They fought even against their fellow Jews who sided with Antiochus and turned away from God. They actually ended up fighting even some of their own fellow Jews in, in all this conflict. Verses 33 through 35. Get to the right page here. Actually, I skipped over... Yeah, I never read verses 31 through 32, so I'm going to read 31 through 35. His armed forces, again in Tychus, will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. And then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. That's the stuff I just described there. I hadn't read those verses yet. But that's the stuff I just described of what fulfilled that. Now, verse 33 through 35. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. And when they fall, they will receive a little help. And many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come. When? At the appointed time. So, the Jews who refused to submit to Antiochus' demands, 
Again, how did this stuff get fulfilled? Keep remembering that. When I share what I share, it's how history says the things that we read in chapter 11 were fulfilled. Not Chapter 11 just gives a general prophecy. Nobody knew how it was going to be fulfilled, but now world history tells us these things that I'm sharing with you. So the Jews who refused to submit to Antiochus' demands, who would not turn away from God, were persecuted. Many of them martyred for their faith. But then the Maccabean revolt was initially led by Mattathias, Maccabeus, a priest, and his sons. One of his sons was Judas Maccabeus, who later took over leadership from his father, and who eventually was the one that restored and cleansed the temple. Mattathias and his sons fled from Jerusalem to the mountains. Gradually, other Jews joined them in the revolt. Some sincere, some not. Some had wrong motives. Eventually, and some would say miraculously, the forces led by the Jewish forces led by Judas Maccabeus defeated the forces of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, and he died a short time later. How this small group of Jewish guys fighting for their homeland and fighting for their God defeated the armies of Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Uh, that's why many say it, it wasn't just them. That it was one of these deals where God was on their side. Now focus. Here's, here's where, where we're going to wind up today. Stay with me. Yes, the Jews of that time who were being killed by Antiochus IV Epiphanes and his soldiers and so forth, they, they were suffering. They were going through the fires of, of trials and tribulations. No question, many died. But the Jews as a people were eventually delivered from that particular persecution and resumed worship in the temple after they restored it and cleansed it and so forth. The reference here in verse 35 to the time of the end, which will come when? At the appointed time, I made you say it when I read it too, that, that, that's very important here. That reference to the time of the end coming at the appointed time, I, in verse 35, I think it had some relevance to what happened with Antiochus Epiphanes and his, his army and so forth. But I think verse 35 is also a transition verse to verse 36. Because at verse 36, the subject matter completely changes. And I'm just going to go over some of the whys today and close with that because obviously we don't have time to, to go on to the rest of the verses of the chapter, but this will, set this, or this will set the stage for next week's sermon to wrap this all up. Many translations of verse 36, not the NIV, but many other translations, start verse 36 with the, the word then. Then the king will do as he pleases. This the king who will do as he pleases, the then... How would that apply to Antiochus Epiphanes when he just got his butt whooped? Not only by the Egyptians, but got kicked out of Israel, got kicked out of Jerusalem. It wasn't about him. It couldn't have been about him. He couldn't do as he pleases after then, after the stuff in verse, 30, verse 35 and the verses before that ended, that couldn't have been about Antiochus Epiphanes. Who was this about? The one who... Antiochus Epiphanes foreshadowed one who still hasn't come yet. That's the change that happens here when you go from verse 35 to verse 36. I think the time of the end and the coming of the time of the end at the appointed time, some application to, yeah, God was going to deliver Israel in that specific situation, but they were going to end up getting persecuted all over again by, by Rome and then by even other Gentiles even since then. But the time, the appointed time of the end that God has set will be when what happens? Jesus returns. The time of the end will be when Jesus comes back at the appointed time and puts an end to all that stuff once and for all. That's ultimately what that phrase, I believe, is referring to. I think the reference to the refining and the purification of the, the nation of Israel in verse 35 here, the last verse that we're dealing with today, I think it indicates that it will continue after the, the horrible days, uh, 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 you know, in that time when, when Antiochus Epiphanes did all his stuff, but that it's going to continue even after that was done and over with and they restored the temple, that it's going to continue and has still continued and is still continuing today until the time when 
the, the picture of Antiochus IV, who he was picturing when the Antichrist comes on the scene, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wind up with all of that. And that will go on and be the worst persecution of Israel ever, Israel ever until Jesus Christ returns to put that down. And when he puts somebody down, they're down for good. Amen? Amen. That's what I believe is happening here. This transition, and I, I know some of it is probably like, uh, I can't follow all that. But try to track with some of the reasons that I'm saying. Starting with the fact that when it says in verse 36, that then the king did as he pleased, how could that refer to Antiochus Epiphanes? He just got, he not only lost to Egypt, but he got beat up by, his forces got beat up by a band of Jews. And he actually went back home to Syria and died. It can't be about him. That's what happened to Antiochus Epiphanes. So verse 36 can't be about him. It's about the one that Antiochus Epiphanes pictured. Verse 36 then begins the description of those horrible days of the Antichrist. That horrible king, the Antichrist. And so, again, just to close up for today, in verse 36, the account in Daniel switches from details that are ancient, ancient history for us today, to details that even still today haven't happened yet. That switch happens as you move from verse 35, I think starting in verse 35 actually, and moving into verse 36. Again, when Daniel wrote, as the angel told him, all this stuff in, in Daniel chapter 11, none of it had happened yet. None of it had happened yet. But now, historical facts, world history shows us that everything up to at least a partial part of verse 35 has already happened. It's already done. But now the rest of this, the rest of the story in chapter 11 here hasn't happened yet. Seems very clear if you look at Daniel chapter 12, which hopefully next week we'll get in and do that too. Daniel 12 hasn't happened yet. For example, verse 2 in Daniel chapter 12 clearly refers to the resurrection of both the saved and the unsaved. That hasn't happened yet. Still hasn't happened yet. Chapter 12 opens with the phrase, at that time, clearly referring to what chapter 11 ends with that we'll finish next week. It, and then chapter 12 begins with, at that time, this stuff is going to happen. At what time? At the time that it just got done talking about at the end of chapter 11. And remember, in the original writing, there wasn't a chapter division. What, what chapter 11 ends with just flowed right into the, the next stuff that was written. That at that time refers to what was just being stated at the end of chapter 11. And at that time, the stuff that it describes after that in chapter 12 is clearly stuff that hasn't happened yet. It's tribulation stuff. The, these are reasons why you say, well, why do you think that this subject changed, you know, from verse 35 to 36? Well, it's not just me, first of all, and even a lot of the Bible translations have a, have a heading division there because scholars recognize that this change, and I'm giving, trying to give you some of the reasons of why we understand this to be what's happening. Careful study also reveals that there's other things in these remaining verses in, in chapter 11 that I'll do next week, Lord willing, that did not apply to Antiochus Epiphanes nor the events of his days, but instead will apply to this future man whom Antiochus foreshadowed again, the Antichrist, and it will happen in the time of wrath that will occur during the final seven-year period, Daniel 70th 7, the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble. And I'll discuss them when we go through the rest of the verses in chapter 11, but again, not today. So to, to, conclude, to conclude with this section, the first 35 verses here, mysterious prophecy fulfilled in so many exact ways. You can look at world history, take the time and do it. You can see how closely it fulfilled it hundreds of years later. And I ask you, I simply ask you, do, do you believe, do you believe that, that these details that the angel had given Daniel hundreds of years before the stuff ended up happening, do, do you believe that that could actually be? Do you believe that God could send an angel to proclaim words of something that was going to happen, descriptions of something that was going to happen, down to exact little wee details, like daughters being given in marriage and all that kind of stuff that world history shows happen? Do you believe that? Because if you can't, if you can't believe in the miraculous, again, you've got a big problem. 
First of all, it's in the Word of God. If you don't believe the Word of God, you've got a big problem. If you don't believe in the miraculous, how can you believe anything about Christianity which revolves around the miraculous resurrection from the dead of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in human flesh? Do you believe that God, through angels and a prophet, could have predicted so many things in such absolute detail, in exact detail? Do you trust the written Word of God, the Bible? Do you really trust it? If, if, if you can find it or if someone can show you, here's what it says and here's what it means, can you trust that? Can you trust that with your life? This is real life Christianity, folks. This is where it does... You might say, okay, man, I don't like history and, you know, whatever. Okay, so more fulfilled prophecy or whatever. But you need to trust this stuff. You need to believe it. Because it affects what's still going to happen. Maybe not in our lifetimes, but stuff that's going to happen. Do you trust the living word? Jesus Christ is the living Word. He is presented to us in the Bible as the only way to receive forgiveness from God. The only way to live life forever in a paradise instead of the hell that you deserve, that I deserve. It's only through Jesus. That's the way the Bible presents Him. Do you really trust in Him for that? As the only way that you can get to a heavenly, eternal life. If you haven't trusted in Jesus, I'll, I pray that you do it right now. Call upon Him to save you because it really is so sweet to trust in Jesus, so sweet to take Jesus at His word, so sweet to rest upon His promise, so sweet to know He is the truth of God because thus saith the Lord. Those are wins, words out of the closing hymn. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 731. Please stand as we sing.